From the legendary Model M to the Ducky 1-2 Mini or even the Razer Huntsman, a keyboard's a keyboard, right? I mean, there really isn't much of a fundamental change in the design of what makes a keyboard what it is, so what advantages can today's gamers expect to find out of buying an actual branded gaming keyboard? Hey, what's going on guys? It's Brainbean here again, and today we're gonna be exploring what makes a gaming keyboard what it is, and what advantages, if any, can today's modern gamer expect to find if they do go with a gaming branded keyboard. Gaming keyboards have been around for at least the last 20 years or so, and while doing my research for this video, I wasn't able to definitively find proof of what the first ever gaming keyboard was, but I do distinctly remember buying sort of backlit style gamery aesthetic keyboards back in the early 2000s. I was able to find that the first ever gaming branded mechanical keyboard was the original Razer Black Widow in 2010, and this keyboard really helped to sort of usher in a new wave of popularity among mechanical keyboards and really introduce these keyboards to a more younger audience. And because keyboards have seen such a dramatic shift in sort of what the norm is over the last 20 years or so, that's ultimately why I decided to tackle this video. Now, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I want to look at what makes a gaming keyboard what it is and ultimately what benefits we can expect to see from using these keyboards. Now, the gaming keyboards of yesteryear definitely took a different approach to the design of the keyboard. And I think there's a couple of different reasons for that. Maybe the biggest reason being that because all these older keyboards were membrane keyboards, they couldn't necessarily get better performance out of one keyboard to the other just based on the technology. And so they had to rely on using flashy backlighting, big sprawling footprints of sort of gamery aesthetic architecture on the, the way the keyboard was designed. And then having a plethora of macro keys all over the board, again, adopting that more buttons is better aesthetic to just sort of make it look like, oh, gamers take you know advantage of all these extra keys because they're so hardcore. I do think a big part of having all those different buttons certainly lends itself to the popularity of games like EverQuest and World of Warcraft at the time frame. Uh, but we also saw games like Diablo and Counter-Strike and Unreal Tournament 2004 being big. And so, you know, maybe that's not necessarily gonna be that big of a benefit during those times, but I do think MMOs played a big influence in why we saw so many macro keys on older keyboards. Now, I personally look back very fondly at my old 2005 Cytex Cyborg keyboard. This thing had a ton of macro keys all over it. The footprint was massive, and it actually had a bunch of different independent lighting zones, which at the time was a pretty unique and cool feature, although they weren't RGB, and it was really just the arrow cluster, the alphanumeric keys, and then a couple of other areas where you could change the colors, but I thought it was super cool, and it certainly did look like a very gamery type keyboard. And like I mentioned, in 2010, Razer introduced the first mechanical keyboard that was designed specifically for gaming. It looked very similar to the look of today's Black Widows with a row of dedicated macro keys on the left side of the board, but with a more toned down overall aesthetic compared to the sprawling over-designed boards that came before it. Now, I'm not saying there weren't other boards that were doing similar things or shifting this way. I'm just using this as an example because it's one of the more documented releases at the time. One thing for certain is that because of its relatively low price point at the time for a mechanical keyboard with blue switches and the marketing potential of a gamery keyboard being available in stores like Best Buy, it's responsible for introducing mechanical keyboards to a new, younger, and more casual audience to the mechanical keyboard scene, which at the time was a fraction of what it is today. In 2014, Corsair shaped the future of gaming peripherals even further by introducing the first mechanical keyboard to feature Cherry MX RGB switches, which, as you guys know, quickly became the standard for any gaming keyboard. From there, things quickly snowballed, pivoting from large keyboards with tons of buttons to slimmed down, more aesthetically pleasing minimalist boards with flashy RGB lighting and tweaked mechanical switch performance. We started seeing gaming companies create their own switches to try and tweak actuation numbers and shave off millimeters to improve overall performance. Some early examples of this are Logitech introducing their Romer G switches and Razer with their green and orange switches, which have gone through quite a few manufacturer changes and revisions since. 
And that sort of brings us to what you can expect to get out of today's gaming keyboards. With many of these proprietary switch types having gone through many revisions, it's a good place to start looking at what modern gaming keyboards bring to the table. Seeing that the original Cherry Switch design was developed in 1985 and remains largely unchanged today, you can see how the needs of today's gaming wouldn't have really been a consideration during their development. Now, while they have good quality and make for great typing switches, and not to mislead, they are just fine for gaming. Gaming companies took it upon themselves to design switches that are more performance oriented to meet the needs of today's fast paced games like battle royales, MOBAs, and just about anything else you can think of. And essentially, the most common differences I see in gaming keyboard switches are shorter actuation distances, or how far the key actually has to be pressed in order to register in the computer, shorter overall travel so that you don't have to push the key as far to bottom it out, and overall actuation force, which makes the keys a little bit lighter and easier to press. You may also see, using Razer switches as an example here, that the reset point or how far the switch has to come back up before it can register another stroke in the computer is much smaller on these switches than on traditional Cherry switches. And this is the part in the video where I always say as a keyboard enthusiast that there really is no wrong switch choice and to spin that around, there is no perfect switch choice either. And ultimately it all boils down to your personal preference and what feels best for you. Because if you like the tactility, the feel, the weight, any of these things on a certain switch, I guarantee you'll perform better than if you were using the industry's fastest and best switch. And we're gonna talk more about why that is here in just a second. With that said, will you get better bleeding edge performance out of a fast oriented gaming switch? Yeah, perhaps if you're playing at the top level and you have very fast superhuman speeds, will it make much difference to the average user? No, not much. The shorter actuation distances and travels in my opinion have a higher impact on the overall feel and typing and gaming experience than an overall enhancement to your actual gaming performance. I think at this time the best gaming oriented switches are the SteelSeries OmniPoint switches with their dynamic actuation point or Razer's Optomechanical switches. Okay, so let's say you're a super enthusiast who lubes your own switches and builds your own keyboards. Will you notice a performance difference in your lubed Holy Pandas versus say a Razer Optomechanical switch? The short answer here is yes and no. On paper, the shorter actuation of the optomechanical switch and better debounce delay with shorter travel will make for a faster switch, but it won't make you a faster human. And this is why I stress choosing your switches more over feel than raw numbers. Now, if you had a top eSports Pro with both of these keyboards, would you notice a difference? Yeah, potentially, given each switch's reset point and ability to recover from one input to the next. The second most common feature among today's gaming keyboards are the companion softwares. And just about every notable gaming brand out there has a respective companion software that's meant to tie all of their different peripherals together into a cohesive ecosystem. A couple of examples of this are Corsair's IQ, Razer's Synapse, or Logitech's G-Hub, just to name a few. These softwares all allow you to do very similar functions such as create and store custom profiles, remap your keybinds, create macros, and sync your lighting effects across all of your peripherals. Now, some of these softwares also feature reactive lighting elements to help immerse you more in the game. For example, Logitech's G-Hub allows you to set an area of your screen to capture and mimic the colors you see on your screen back on your peripherals. Or Razer Synapse, which has a massive library of games with supported integrated effects with the lights that will change on your peripherals while you game. Now for an immersive gaming experience, this is one of the better features of today's gaming keyboards in my opinion. Of course, with just about any mechanical keyboard on the market these days, you can get some degree of lighting customization and macro recording. These companion softwares just create a much more user-friendly experience with their own intuitive interfaces and ease of use designed to cater to both the novice and experienced users. Now, of course, gaming keyboards of today do certainly have other features that vary on a case-by-case -case basis. Typically, little things like integrated cable channels for headsets or USB and audio pass-through just kind of help to consolidate things on your desk a little bit. But again, those are gonna be things that you'll wanna purchase based on your specific need. Now, over the last five years or so, we've certainly seen a huge uptick in popularity around mechanical keyboards, and this led to a couple of different things happening out there in the world. You have people that are much more informed about the type of keyboards that they want and the features that they expect. And then you also have the gaming industry sort of lagging behind to keep up with that level of informed consumerism and also just you know bring the features that people want, which led a lot of this community to turn to brands like Ducky, for example, 
to get the features that they wanted or even build their own keyboards. Now, thankfully, around the last year or so, the gaming community and the gaming companies have really started to pick up on what today's consumer really wants to see in terms of level of quality and features. And this led to much better proprietary switch designs, stock PBT keycaps, better stabilizers stock, even in some cases, hot swappable switches. And so seeing the community have this sort of influence on the gaming brands and sort of how they develop their keyboards is a really good thing. So what are the advantages of buying a gaming keyboard today? I mean, what reason, if any, should you go with the SteelSeries keyboard over a drop keyboard, for example? And I think here is where knowing what you wanna get out of your keyboard is extremely important. Do you want a typist friendly keyboard that can supplement some gaming here and there? Or is the only thing you care about playing games and enhancing that experience as much as possible? Budget and availability are also a major factor. Gaming keyboards tend to be overall more available to pick up in store over the more popular non-gaming branded keyboards like Ducky or Drop, for example. Although with this state of rapid shipping out there in the world and being able to buy something and have it on your doorstep in a few days, this has rapidly become less of an issue. I also think it's really important, guys, to just take a step back and realize that there's a lot of people out there that aren't looking to make keyboards a hobby, and they simply just want a keyboard that's gonna give them a great gaming experience. And I think today's gaming keyboards, especially with the influence from the sort of enthusiast community really is gonna give them the best experience that really could be had up until this point with sort of an added benefit, which is these keyboards of today from gaming companies sort of borrowing from that enthusiast community gives the casual user a sort of toe dip into the rabbit hole of the enthusiast community, which ultimately might spark some interest in sort of you know, create another person who's gonna find a passion with keyboards. And whether you're like me and you just really like mechanical keyboards or you're researching your next keyboard purchase, if you wanna go down the keyboard rabbit hole even more, I've got two more really great videos for you. I'll link down in the description. First one is whether to build or buy your next keyboard and also five very simple upgrades you can do to augment just about any mechanical keyboard out there. But anyways, guys, with that, I hope you found this video helpful. I certainly enjoyed researching this and actually learned quite a bit more about this industry than I previously knew and kind of looked at it from a different light. Let me know down in the comments below what you think about the gaming keyboards of today and sort of what your approach to that whole world of peripherals is. You can give this video a like if you enjoyed it, show your support. And if you're new here on the channel, I'd love to see you subscribe. I've got a lot more videos like this coming for you in the near future. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.